vaccines. Uh, I'm sure unless you've been living in a cave in Siberia, you've heard something about this in the last month because there's been a lot of news about it. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today is day 269 of the pandemic. Um, so what I wanna do today is do a brief review of immunology, genetics, and vaccine science. Um, I'm gonna try to make this uh, understandable even if you don't have a science background. I'm gonna talk more in depth about the three leading vaccine candidates. I'll talk some about vaccine safety and then leave you with some resources at the end. Next slide, please. Uh, objectives for today, one is to become familiar with the process of vaccine development. Number two would be to come, become familiar with the three leading uh, vaccine candidates and uh, how they basically work. And then I also want you to be familiar with the safety measures that have been taken with uh, these vaccines as well as all vaccines. Um, there's an awful lot of misinformation, um, hysteria out there right now. And uh, I think it's important that we as healthcare workers uh, have some knowledge about uh, these issues and we can hopefully address them and relieve some of that anxiety. Next slide, please. I do have some disclaimers besides the fact that my internet is not the greatest. Uh, I, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I don't have any horses in this race. I don't own any stock in any of these companies. Um, I am gonna be mentioning some countries by name, but I, I do want you to understand that that's not for any reason other than just giving you background information. There's been a good bit of talk about vaccine nationalism and that is uh, you know, countries, especially the more developed countries, the richer countries trying to hoard vaccine and you know, get more for their citizens. And um, this certainly is not in the spirit of uh, cooperation or really in dealing with the pandemic because we're gonna have to deal with it on a worldwide basis and not just country by country. I also will be mentioning some vaccine and pharmaceutical companies by name, um, but that doesn't imply any endorsement of any company or product over any others. Uh, next slide, please. So let's get into the science of this. Uh, talk about um, the body's immune system, how it basically works. This uh, little picture here on the left shows uh, a sort of little cartoon version of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19. You can see that it has RNA inside it. That's its genetic material because it's an RNA virus. And on the surface of the virus are these uh, spikes. Uh, Dr. Mira showed you a, a picture of that earlier in his presentation. So what happens when a person gets infected? Well, the virus goes into the body, it attaches to cells, enters those cells, and then starts to, to replicate. It reproduces itself by hijacking your cellular machinery. Eventually, there's an antigen, a, a special cell called an antigen presenting cell that takes up the virus. And, and then this cell carries the virus to the immune system to be recognized as a foreign invader. Um, the white blood cells in the body, which are responsible for fighting infection, come in many varieties, but um, one variety are lymphocytes. And lymphocytes come in two basic varieties, B cells and T cells. Um, there are T cells called T helper cells that can recognize these um, viral invaders. And then these helper T cells call on other immune cells to help out and fight the infection. Next slide, please. So the helper T cells go out and they notify B-type lymphocytes that they need to make some antibodies. And so the B cells start cranking out antibodies. There are also other types of T cells called cytotoxic T cells that can recognize our cells that are infected and destroy those cells so that it destroys the virus as well. 
Now, once we've cleared out an infection, there are some memory B cells and memory T cells that hang around, uh, hopefully for a long, long time, so that if you're ever infected again by this virus, these memory B cells uh, rev up and start cranking out antibodies. And then the cytotoxic T cells will reproduce and uh, go around looking for um, infected cells to get rid of. So that, that's kind of a very, very brief view of um, viral immunology. Next slide, please. So this talk is about vaccines. Um, what are the advantages of vaccines? Well, the, I think the great thing about them is that it allows you to develop immunity to a specific disease without having to suffer through having the disease. So it, it basically let your immune system do what it would do if you were actually infected with the disease without being infected with the disease. Uh, sometimes the immunity that a vaccine produces is not as good as it would be if you had the natural disease, but in some cases it's as good or even better. And uh, vaccines have been around for a while. Um, viral vaccines have been around since the 1940s, uh, the influenza vaccine being the first one. Uh, but they've eradicated one disease, smallpox, and they've greatly decreased uh, death and suffering from a lot of other diseases. Next slide, please. So how do they work? Um, well, there, there are several, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about the eight different technologies that exist now to make viral vaccines. But in the old days, they took either a weakened form of the virus that is so-called live attenuated virus. Um, and they uh, made the vaccine out of that or an inactivated virus, one that had been inactivated, rendered harmless by being treated with heat or some chemical. Um, or later in the eighties, we developed uh, protein subunit vaccines. So just a part of the virus was made into a vaccine and injected. Once the vaccine's injected, the immune system responds and makes antibodies, and sometimes also makes the cytotoxic T cells, but that's not true with all uh, vaccines. And then the immune memory is created just like it would be in a natural infection. Next slide, please. So there's, there's a new technology out there, several new technologies actually, that um, are genetic technologies. So what these technologies do, they take um, either RNA or DNA, genetic code, make it into a vaccine, inject it in your body. Then the genetic code actually instructs your cells to make a certain part of the virus. Then your cells uh, basically secrete that part of the virus. The immune system recognizes it as foreign and makes antibodies and often a T cell um, response is generated as well. And immune memory is created just like it would be with the natural disease. And I'll talk a little more in detail about this. Next slide, please. So how are vaccines developed? Well, first of all, you, you, in a lab, a potential vaccine is developed and it's first tested in animals uh, the usual victims are rats and mice and uh, non-human primates like uh, macaque monkeys. And then once it looks like it works and it's safe in animals, they move on to human trials. Now phase one, there's usually a small number of very brave individuals who volunteer to take the vaccine. And phase one is mainly looking at safety to make sure that you know, people don't grow an extra finger or your eyeball falls out or something like that. Uh, in phase two, this usually involves a uh, hundred, several hundred volunteers. And usually phase two is about finding the optimal dose. And so they usually try several different dose strengths and figure out which one works the best. And then phase three trials involve thousands of volunteers 
And this is an effectiveness test in a population to see if it actually prevents the disease that it's designed to prevent. Now, before a vaccine is ever approved or even given an emergency use authorization by the FDA, the safety of the vaccine must be demonstrated in you know, a very rigorous way. And safety is looked at in all three phases. Next slide, please. So there are really two basic technologies that can be further divided into about eight um, different technologies, but basically the first four on this list, either inactivated virus, live attenuated, protein subunit, or viral-like particles. All of these vaccines involve injecting either the virus or a part of the virus into you to get your body's immune system to make, um, to do its thing and make you immune to the virus. The last four technologies are genetic, um, replicating viral vectors, non-replicating viral vectors, DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines. All of these are genetic vaccines. So in other words, um, the genetic code for your cells to make a part of the virus that can then be seen by your immune system and develop an immune response to, that's how these all work. And I'll go over, uh, next slide. Um, I'm going to discuss two of these technologies in greater detail, the non-replicating viral vector and the RNA. Next slide, please. So let's pause briefly to take a little test. Um, who knows how many current COVID-19 vaccine candidates are in phase three trials? Is it three, seven, 10, 13, or none of the above? Uh, Hugh is saying it's three, okay. Um, any other guesses? Three or none? Uh, uh, Dr. Mira says none. <laughs> All right, I'll give you the answer. Next slide. Currently, as of December 2nd, there are 13 vaccine candidates that are in phase three human trials around the world. Uh, this is just kind of a comparison slide here. If you look back to September, the World Health Organization Vaccine Candidate Tracker um, had uh, 38 vaccine candidates that were in human trials. Today, there are 51. Uh, three months ago, there were nine in phase three. Now there are 13. And you can see that there are over 200 vaccine candidates now that are in some phase of development. And you can look at for yourself at the WHO's um, vaccine tracker. Um, and yeah, the question is, yes, that includes all vaccines globally um, that are being tracked. Next slide. So these are the 13 that are currently um, in phase three. There are four that are inactivated viral vaccines, four that are non-replicating viral vector. Uh, one protein subunit, one viral-like particle, and two messenger RNA vaccines. And I'll go into detail, next slide, on, uh, I'm, I'm going to go into detail on the AstraZeneca, the Pfizer, and the Moderna vaccines. Next slide. Uh, if, if you noticed on that last slide, many countries around the world are involved. So let's briefly review genetics because both of these or all three of these vaccines are genetic type vaccines. So if you remember from uh, high school biology or college biology or um, somewhere along the way, you may have learned about DNA, which is um, the human genetic code. Uh, it's in a double helix form in our cells, which makes it very stable. But when when DNA needs to be put into action, it is transcribed into messenger RNA. And then the messenger RNA is used by these little things in cells called ribosomes to make various proteins. Now these might be enzymes, might be uh, hormones, might be structural proteins, but 
This is going on in every one of us right this minute as we speak. The beta cells in your pancreas are having DNA transcribed to messenger RNA that then make insulin. So um, this, this goes on in all of us every day inside our cells. And the thing about messenger RNA, it's rapidly degraded after it's used to make whatever protein we need at the time. So DNA hangs around forever, but messenger RNA goes away after it's used. The body has endonucleases that degrade it. Next slide, please. So I'm sure all of you have seen some sort of picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. Um, it's a, an RNA virus. Inside it is the RNA genetic material of the virus that's surrounded by an envelope. And then on this envelope, on the surface, are these spike uh, proteins. And the spike is what the virus uses to attach to our cells and get inside uh, reproduce themselves and wreak havoc on the rest of us. Next slide, please. That spike protein is very important because most of the vaccine candidates use that as their target. So let's talk a little bit about non-replicating viral vector vaccines. Boy, say that three times really fast. Um, so the way that these vaccines are made a, a DNA virus like um, an adenovirus, which is a common cold virus, they take that, they snip out part of the genetic material inside it um, to render it non-harmful. And then they insert genetic material, DNA, that uh, is coded for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, then that's injected, the DNA goes inside your cell, it's transcribed in the usual way to messenger RNA, and then it begins to make proteins with the ribosomes, in this case, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Then the body's immune system um, makes antibodies and has a T cell response, hopefully, and that makes, um, that makes your immune system, that makes you immune to the to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Next slide, please. So there's, uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Talal. So you've probably, or most of you have heard of the AstraZeneca at Oxford vaccine. Um, this is, AstraZeneca is a company in the United Kingdom. Oxford is a university in the United Kingdom. They have used a non-replicating um, virus uh, from uh, a chimpanzee, chimpanzee adenovirus. And the reason that they used a chimpanzee one is because most humans are not immune to chimpanzee adenoviruses. So therefore, we won't um, be able to attack and kill the virus as it comes in before it can do its thing by delivering the uh, DNA. So, they, they had a head start because they originally used this technology for um, mirrors a number of years ago. Uh, the name of it is now AZD-1222. The phase one and two trials showed that more than 90% of people developed neutralizing antibodies. There were no serious adverse events um, reported in over a thousand people in those trials. There were some pretty common uh, side effects like injection site pain, fatigue, headache, chills, fever, muscle aches, just not feeling well. Um, phase three trials were started in late July uh, in Brazil, the United Kingdom, and the US. Next slide, please. Um, there was a serious adverse event in the phase three trial that caused a pause starting September 8th. Uh, the UK and Brazil trials resumed shortly afterwards, but uh, the US trials were paused until October 23rd, I guess when the FDA finally determined that the serious adverse event was not vaccine related. So they did an interim analysis uh, very recently when uh, there were 131 cases of COVID-19 in the study group. Um, 
And what they found was in the UK trial, uh, where there were almost 3,000 participants, um, they got 90% of efficacy. The interesting thing was, though, these trial participants inadvertently only got a half dose, the first dose, and got a full dose, the second dose. This vaccine requires two doses. And it was 90% efficacious. In Brazil, where they had almost 9,000 participants, they used a full dose the first time and a full dose the second time, and they only got 62% effectiveness. So combining that, they got around 70% effectiveness. Now there's phase three is still ongoing. They want to get up to 60,000 subjects. They're going to do more testing with the half dose, full dose combination. Um, the US phase three trial will still be several weeks, I think, before there's enough data accumulated. Um, next slide, please. Now, interestingly, one of the things about this vaccine and the phase three trial is they, um, they actually swabbed people's noses periodically because they wanted to see if it actually prevented infection as well as prevented disease. And what they found out was that it did. So that's really good news. Um, we don't know that about the other two vaccines I'm gonna talk about. Um, and you can't extrapolate to necessarily say that uh, it'll work the same way. Um, the company says that there were no serious safety events related to the vaccine that have been confirmed. Uh, they hope to produce 3 billion doses by the end of next year. And another good news about this vaccine is that it can be stored and transported at refrigerator temperatures for up to six months. Now, all of this information is not in peer-reviewed journals yet. It was taken from the company's press release, basically. Next slide. So let's switch now to RNA vaccines. So the way that this works, um, the vaccine candidate is a strand of messenger RNA that codes for the uh, spike protein of the SARS virus, SARS-CoV-2. They package it in tiny little particles of lipid or fat. Um, it's injected and these fat particles transport it inside your cells. This has been the problem for RNA vaccines. They've been working on these vaccines for more than 20 years. The problem was not making RNA, the problem was getting it inside your cells. Fortunately, this technology has been recently perfected so that they could get it inside the cell because if it's floating around your bloodstream, your body just degrades it really fast. So once it's inside the cell, it gets out of the little nanoparticles. The ribosomes take it up and they start making the spike protein. Then it goes through the usual immune process. The body recognizes the spike as foreign and makes antibodies and T cells against it. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about two RNA vaccines. These are probably gonna be, uh, one has already been approved in the United Kingdom a couple of days ago, and it's, it's this vaccine. Uh, most people know it as the Pfizer vaccine. It was actually developed by a small company in Germany, BioNTech. They partnered then with a US company, Pfizer, in order to make the vaccine you know, on a large scale. Um, they developed a couple of different candidates that they used in phase one. Uh, all the participants in phase one developed neutralizing antibodies and there were no serious safety concerns. There were, you know, the usual injection site pain, feeling bad, fatigue, headache. Uh, they chose BNT162B2 to go on to the phase two and three trials because it produced fewer side effects and was just as effective. And uh, this has been uh, published. Uh, the phase one data is published and I've given you the link there. Next slide, please. Um, so what about phase three? So um, phase three started in late July. By uh, early November, they had accumulated enough results to um, say whether or not it worked. They had over 43,000 participants in five different countries who took part in the phase three trials. 30% uh, of these participants were, were not white, 
basically. They were racially or ethnically diverse. This consists of two uh, injections, 21 days apart. Um, the initial data uh, was with about 94 cases, but then uh, nine days later, they were up to 170 cases of COVID-19 in the study group. 162 of those were in the people that got the placebo. There were only eight cases in the vaccine group. So that's pretty good evidence that it works. Um, that you know, estimated efficacy of 95%, which is really excellent. This held up even in people who were 65 and older. Um, they did just as well. There were 10 severe cases of COVID in the study group. Nine of those were in the placebo group, only one in the vaccine group. Um, this is all too from, it's not from peer reviewed stuff yet, it's just from the press release from the company. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, it also looked at infection prevention as well as disease prevention. And they found that it did, um, was highly effective at preventing infection at all. So that's good news because if you're not infected, you can't, can't spread it. Uh, there were no serious adverse events observed. Um, so on November 20th, they submitted a request to the FDA for an emergency use authorization. The FDA will meet on December 10th to consider this. Pfizer expects to have 50 million doses available by the end of December and 1.3 million, 1.3 billion doses in 2021. Now, this is the vaccine that requires really, really cold temperatures. You have to, it can be stored up to six months at minus 70 degrees centigrade. That's minus 94 Fahrenheit. But you can store it in the refrigerator at two to eight centigrade, which is what, 36 to 46 Fahrenheit uh, temperature uh, for five days. So it is stable in the refrigerator for up to five days. So the second RNA vaccine is the Moderna vaccine. It's a messenger RNA vaccine that's uh, inside these lipid nanoparticles, very similar to the Pfizer vaccine. They worked in partnership with uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. In the phase one trial, they showed that uh, neutralizing antibodies developed in all participants after two doses and there were no serious adverse effects. There were pretty common side effects of fatigue, chills, headache, muscle ache, injection site pain. Now this vaccine only requires minus 20 degrees centigrade, that's minus four degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of usual freezer uh, temperatures. I know I have a freezer upstairs that will, um, would be able to store this vaccine at those temperatures. It's also stable for up to 30 days at refrigerator temperatures. So that's, um, that makes it a lot easier to store and it's stable at room temperature for up to 12 hours. So I guess the major advantage, if you want to call it that, of the Moderna vaccine is that it doesn't have to be stored quite as cold and it's stable at uh, refrigerator temperatures for longer. I've given you some uh, references there if you want to look into this yourself. Next slide. So Moderna reported their phase three results on November 16th and the 30th. They had over 30,000 participants, 11,000 were non-white, 7,000 were 65 and older, 5,000 were people under 65 with medical comorbidities. Um, originally on the 16th, they said that it was about 95 4.5% effective on the first 95 cases, but by November 30th, they had 196 COVID cases. There were only 11 of these cases in the vaccine group, giving an efficacy of about 94.1%. Again, that's excellent, excellent efficacy. There were 30 serious cases, zero in the vaccine group. So even the people that got sick who had been vaccinated did not get seriously ill. They did have those uh, common side effects, as I mentioned. They found that the side effects were more common after the second dose. And this vaccine is actually two doses given 28 days apart. Next slide. 
I, I thought I would also just show you the timeline for development. Um, Moderna has published this on their website and I found it really interesting. So as, as we all know, the first cases of COVID were recognized in China in late December. By January 11th, Chinese scientists had sequenced the genome of SARS-CoV-2 and had shared it with the world. Um, by February 7th, Moderna had prepared a clinical batch of uh, M1273, which is the name that they've given to the vaccine. By the middle of March, they had started phase one trials. They had positive results from phase one by the middle of May. Into July, they started phase three trials after doing some phase two trials. Um, by November 16th, they had some preliminary results. And by November 30th, they had uh, quite robust results that allowed them to request an emergency use authorization from the FDA. And the FDA has scheduled um, a committee hearing on December 17th to consider their EUA request. Moderna says they expect to have 20 million doses by the end of December and 500 million by the uh, end of next calendar year. Next. So those are the three vaccine candidates that are likely to be out first in the United States. I expect the two RNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, to be released before Christmas. Don't, I mean, that's just my guess, but I, I think there's good reason to expect mm -hmm. that. So I wanna talk now about vaccine safety because this is on everybody's mind. So on September 8th, uh, an unprecedented thing happened. The CEOs of nine major vaccine manufacturers signed a letter in which they pledged to make safety and well-being of vaccinated individuals their top priority. I say that this is unprecedented because it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I really think that it was in response to a lot of speculation that shortcuts were being taken, the vaccine was being rushed due to political pressure. Then on October 6, the FDA said that there had to be a follow-up duration of at least two months after completion of the full vaccination regimen before you could submit an application for emergency use authorization. This was to give a two month time period to look for any kind of serious side effects from vaccines. Most serious side effects from vaccines will show up within the first six weeks. So two months was chosen to kind of give, you know, an extra cushion for that. And uh, both the Moderna and Pfizer have passed that two month waiting period now. Next slide. Now, a lot of people have said, you know, the fastest any vaccine has ever been made before was four years. So how is it that they're, they're making a vaccine in less than a year's time? That they, they must have taken some shortcuts. Well, they did take shortcuts, but not with safety. And that's the important thing. So what led to this? Well, I think it's kind of a perfect storm, in this case, a good storm, uh, just a confluence of, of several things. Um, number one, you know, unless you've been living in a cave in Siberia, you know that there's a worldwide pandemic. And as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. So there was a lot of impetus to develop vaccines. Uh, the internet today allows much, much faster communication and sharing of knowledge. You know, we don't have to wait for things to be published um, in a journal that takes time. They can now pre-print um, online and uh, the knowledge can be shared and people can be looking at it sooner. But I think um, the thing that has really, really allowed this to happen has been the advance in genetics over the last few decades. You know, Watson and Crick um, was, what was it, 1953 when they first described you know, the DNA double helix as being maybe our genetic code. It wasn't until 2003, just 17 years ago, that the human genome was first um, sequenced. Nowadays, you can, you know, spit in a cup and pay, you know, $100 or less 
and get your entire genome sequence. That's how far we've progressed in 17 years. Um, and these messenger RNA vaccines, they were first conceived of about 30 years ago. There's been a lot of work done on them for the last 20 years because it was recognized that messenger RNA vaccines could be inherently safer than the older technologies and uh, could be much faster to develop. And indeed, that's, you know, the faster to develop has definitely come about. Then the other thing is there's been unprecedented financial support. You know, governments, the US, Canada, Australia, the European Union, the UK have ponied up billions, literally billions of dollars and euros. Um, and that's taken away the financial liability that you know, the develop, vaccine developers would have otherwise faced. And that's one of the reasons that vaccines are so slow to develop is because of people not wanting to take on that financial liability. Now, I knew when I made this slide that was something that I had left off. And indeed, I remember now what it was. When you're in the middle of a pandemic, you can do a phase three trial in a matter of two or three months rather than two or three years. So the fact that there's a pandemic going on, very prevalent um, disease, it allows you to um, very quickly get results because there's a lot of disease going on. So they were able to you know, conduct these phase three trials in as little as three months. Plus because of the pandemic, there are plenty of people willing to volunteer to be phase three trial subjects. So all of these things have, have come together to make this happen in record time. Next slide, please. So I, I will apologize for going over time today. I, I hope I haven't bored you too much with all the nerdy science. Um, this slide has some resources. If you wanna look at vaccine tracking, there are several websites that do that. Um, there's a great basic vaccine technology article from, of all things, a veterinary uh, journal. And then the CDC vaccine website for COVID-19 has a lot of great information. So next slide, I think is my say goodbye slide. Uh, thanks very much. I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Um, great. Thank you, Dr. Brown. We did have one question in the chat box. <clears throat> Can it be predicted in advance whether which, whether or which of the vaccines will be required to carry out phase four and five trials, given the very unusual situation? Great question. Uh, thanks for whoever asked that. All of these vaccines will be subject to phase four trials. Um, so phase four is actually after a vaccine is released for use, um, the phase for trial is follow-up. And it's really, again, looking at both efficacy, but especially at safety. So as a vaccine is used in hundreds of thousands or millions or maybe billions of people, if there are any rare side effects, those can be uh, discovered in a phase four trial. All of these vaccines will be subject to phase four trials. And <clears throat> has there been any indication of when or how easily it will be available, uh, be available to the public? Uh, that's another great question. Oh, you're on mute. Dr. Brown, I think we lost you. How about now? Can you hear me now? Gotcha. Yes. Okay. I had accidentally muted myself again. So the the information that I have is the vaccine's going to be in, you know, initially will be in very limited supply. For instance, the state of North Carolina is slated to get, I think, 85,000 doses of uh, vaccine as soon as it's released. That's enough to cover less than 1% of the state's population. So I'm just using that as an example. Um, 
hopefully the vaccine production will be ramped up pretty fast. Uh, some government officials are saying that by next June, everybody that wants a vaccine will be vaccinated. Great. Any other questions? I have a question, Dr. Brown. Yes. <laughs> um, Beverly Cook. Um, hi, Bev. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, so we have a... Um, um, an issue with um, relaying the safety profile to the community. In other words, there's, you know, lots of people in our community that are suspicious of the vaccine. And yesterday I was on a call and I got a text, an urgent text from someone all in caps that this, um, the vaccines that are coming out are going to change our DNA. <clears throat> And so somehow we need to be able to message them some of the things that, that you've been explaining, you know, about the messenger RNA and what happens to it after it's in the cell and um, that, that type of thing. So I don't know. Um, we've been talking to different folks like at NIH about materials that um, people can see or um, short little videos that explain exactly how it works. And um, so I'm just wanted to thank you for that, you know, for the explanation is helpful. I'm just wondering if you're aware of any material that's out there that we can use to help allay some of the fears of the vaccine. That's, that's a really great issue. Um, we, several of us at USED actually met early this morning to talk about that very subject. Uh, we're hoping to put out uh, some educational materials in the form of short videos that people can see that hopefully will allay some of these um, fears that people have. Uh, the other thing, we're, we're hoping to have a sort of town hall with a panel of uh, physicians and other experts uh, to address tribal leaders and community members um, to, to talk about these issues and answer questions that people have. You know, there's, there's just, unfortunately, there's so much, so much misinformation out there, especially on social media. And um, I mean, I'm going to be the first to say, you know, when I get the COVID vaccine, whichever one I get, um, and I'm going to get the first one that's available uh, to me. Um, you know, am I going to be nervous about it? Yeah, I'm going to be nervous because I'm nervous every time I get a flu shot. I'm nervous about any vaccine because um, there are the very, very, very rare side effects. You know, we're talking one in a million people who do have some kind of serious idiopathic reaction. But the safety data that's been coming out so far um, especially with these RNA vaccines, the safety data has been extremely encouraging. And, you know, at this point, those, those phase one people were vaccinated way back in March. So, you know, we do have a good eight, nine months of uh, close observation on those initial people. And so far, no serious side effects. And no, Bill Gates is not putting microchips in these vaccines to control us all. Um, so <laughs> yeah, anything, any ideas you have to, to help with this would be really greatly appreciated because we really do need to have probably 70% of the population to get vaccinated in order to have community immunity. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown. Hey, Cameron. Hey, um, I have a question in regards to support staff and vaccination. I know that the CDC recommendation and the recommendation that you guys sent out was for healthcare staff. Um, but I know that especially for a lot of our smaller clinics, administrative staff are oftentimes assisting healthcare workers, um, even though that may not be ideal. Um, is the recommendation to include them as healthcare staff? 
And if so, does that also extend to other administrative staff like a builder or a coder who, even though they're not always necessarily directly supporting, they, they get plenty of interaction and they're sharing the same air sources? Um, again, uh, that's a several great issues you raised there, Cameron. Um, so I guess it would have been a good thing for the author of that paper, who was me, um, to have specified healthcare worker. You know, healthcare worker is whatever you define it to be in your individual clinic. I would say anybody who has any contact with patients in any way should, you know, be considered in that group to get vaccinated. And that might be in a small clinic, that might be every single individual because so many people wear so many different hats in a small clinic. You know, you, yeah, you may normally be in the back office, but maybe you come out and take your, your turn at the front desk, you know, checking patients in or answering the phone. So I really think you should uh, use a pretty broad definition of who is a healthcare worker. Um, so let's see, what was your other question? It, it, you answered all of them. It was basically about um, how to resource even if you're frontline or administrative staff. Right. And, you know, um, we were at Cherokee Indian Hospital in North Carolina. I was talking um, recently to the person who's in charge of the vaccination program there. And he really expects that, um, you know, if we, if we get an initial shipment of say a thousand doses, um, we're probably going to go well past the 1A group and into the 1B and the 2, priority 2, and possibly even priority 3, because there are going to be a lot of people who refuse to take it at first because they're afraid. And I understand that. Um, you know, I kind of jokingly say, well, that's okay. That leaves, that leaves more for me. <laughs> but that's, that's not really a good thing to say, I guess. But um, no, I, I, I really hope that we can dispel a lot of the fear around this and get people to line up and roll up their sleeve and take the vaccine. And again, I don't have a, I don't have a horse in this race other than I really want this pandemic to be over. And the best way we're gonna get out of this is to vaccinate as many people as we can. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Thank you. Brian, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, we I see Dr. Kelly has a, has a question. Um, Dr. Kelly has asked if uh, Pfizer is the only vaccine maker who has offered their product. I actually don't have any information on that. Um, I don't know if IHS is going to get the Pfizer product, is going to get the Moderna product, is going to get both Pfizer and Moderna. I suspect that as the vaccine is released in small amounts, we'll probably get both. And uh, that looks like Chris McKnight at Cherokee is uh, confirming what I just said. Great. Do we have any additional comments or questions for Dr. Brown? If not, we can adjourn for today. Uh, there is the link in the uh, chat for uh, the survey to help us improve the sessions. Uh, if you will fill the survey out, that'd be greatly appreciated. And have a great Friday and a great we'll week. See you in two weeks. See you, you in two your, weeks. Get your continuing education units. You get credit for this. <laughs>